So hello and welcome everybody. In today's Sacred Wisdom podcast, we are going to talk about the conclusions of Tartaria. And by the conclusions, I mean the summarization of the Tartarian technology and the machines they use, the airships, their architecture, and how this ancient technology progressed from Hyperborea. And I am joined with the amazing Stephen Denver today. Hello, Stephen. How are you? I'm well, Zach. I hope was good with you. Very well, my brother. Um, first and foremost, let's just talk about these machines and how these developed over the years and how they've kind of disappeared in, in the modern age, if you like, or just gone into the background. Let's talk about that. I think we have to go back to the time of the Nordic Hyperboreans and the existences they developed with such um, incredible sophistication in the Arctic North Polar region. Obviously, this includes northern Russia. And we have to remember that they had constructed vast numbers of what is now definable as shining pyramids or crystal pyramids. Now, these had large quartz capstones. They were able to draw down, absorb, and then redistribute huge amounts of telluric electricity from the atmosphere above the Arctic North Polar region, including, obviously, northern Russia. And this was used to literally sustain uh, the, the, their own civilization. And obviously, over many, many, many centuries, many aeons of time, uh, the arising of Great Dataria then took place. So if we go back before the time of 25,869 BC, this was when the golden age or the golden period of Hyperborea really had flourished. It was a time of absolute harmonious bliss based on the uh, balanced and uh, very grounded and focused usage of occult technology, especially with these shining pyramids or crystal pyramids that were essentially large, um, shall we say, mechanistic buildings and obviously we've talked about the machines of Tataria in a previous sacred wisdom podcast obviously the airships of Tataria as well we know that the Hyperboreans had specific types of levitating or floating platforms these were metallic they were rectangular in shape and they were based off the use of drawing down absorbing and concentrating telluric electricity again to create some type of anti-gravity impulse that could be used to move these, um, shall we say, airborne vehicles, you know, over the land masses of the Arctic North Polar region. Yeah, so we go back to the time of Greek mythology and all the stories concerning the Hyperboreans that lived in the land of the midnight sun. It was balmy weather all year round. So it was warm, it was breezy, it was highly fertile. So this lends one to the idea that they would have had advanced forms of electroculture based occult technology in Hyperborea across the Arctic North Polar region and therefore the Arctic Circle. Uh, they were able to grow all the different types of very large, voluptuous and highly delicious fruits and vegetables and enormous looking cereal crops. So they had vast amounts of diverse foodstuffs for consumption and trade purposes in Hyperborea. We therefore know there must have been some connection between these shining pyramids or shall we say the crystal pyramids that in some fashion were used electromagnetically, you know, to enhance the, the, the cellular structure of these fruits, vegetables and cereal crops. So we know that the the rudimentary basis of Great Tataria when it comes to its own advanced occult technology was really something that had originated directly from the time of Hyperborea, you know, beyond, shall we say, the Raphaean mountains in the Arctic North Polar region and therefore the Arctic Circle and obviously including northern Russia. And we know that it was a time of great splendor before that date with the demise and ultimate destruction of Hyperborea after the period of 25,869 B.C., you know, obviously the, the demise brought about a complete redevelopment over many generations of time, but the occult technology wasn't completely lost in that process. It was just redeveloped, it was reconfigured, reformatted, and it was eventually reproduced in some fashion uh, during the civilization of Great Tataria. So, Steve, where do you think all this technology has gone? now bringing it into the modern age where where did it disappear to why have we gone into this wire-based system of of electrics 
it's all about control, control of human consciousness, control of human behavior. It is done and has been done since its inception for financial gain, for the profit that's needed by the corporations. That represents the accumulation, if you like, of energy in the form of money and financial control over the masses, you know, it, across planet Earth, especially where you see it in the Western world, and you can see it today, for example, in the countries of mainland Europe, and obviously including the United Kingdom of Great Britain, the Irish Republic, and obviously within the United States of America and Canada, and across most of Latin America, and then around the world, you see this process going on. And, you know, the, with the collapse of Great Tataria, what you have to remember was we had many of these inventors during the, the Victorian age, during the Edwardian period, going right up to the beginning of World War One, who were still yeah. creating these wonderful inventions. Obviously, we've mentioned many times Victor Schauberg, we've mentioned many times Nikola Tesla and so on. Mm. And these individuals, their, their inventions were produced, um, but not on a, a major commercial level. And then their information was quelled, it was suppressed, it was censored, it was deleted, it was sidelined. And there was no investment basis put in by any of the uh, the banks or the corporations to the work of Victor Schauberg or, or the, the incredible inventions of Nikola Tesla and many other quite unique geniuses who really the history books don't really want to mention are certainly not given any discussion um, in the Western world, certainly not by Western science when it comes to the education of pupils in schools or the education of students in colleges and universities. With Nikola Tesla, now he was apparently wanted to find maps in northern Siberia. He was That's looking right. for maps at the time when he was doing all these inventions. Do you think he had sort of extra knowledge that like a secret knowledge that we weren't we didn't know about or he was given or like what Nikola Tesla is a very interesting chap in what he invented but yet almost kind of disregarded in this day and age a bit anyway I mean he is remembered but not to the length of what if his what his inventions were I think he he knew a lot more than he lit on what his connections were to shall we say, the powers that be or the elites or whatever name you want to designate them, I don't know. We don't know exactly what he did know, what he didn't know. We know that he had access that could have been, you know, for an information he was receiving from the astral plane. It's being purported he was getting some kind of psychic transmissions from perhaps ultra terrestrials or extraterrestrials while he was dreaming or perhaps when he was meditating. And then he was drawing out these incredibly intricate diagrams or schematics mm. going into his uh, laboratories and then obviously uh, manufacturing on a small scale and test bedding them, getting them photographed, recording all the, uh, the actual scientific data from his experiments. And Nikola Tesla was seen as, you know, quite a unique genius um, by the Eastern establishment in the United States of America, you know, across cities like New York, like Chicago, like Boston, for example, he was seen as a fascinating individual. And I know that he apparently had a very amiable and very kind personality. He was a very down to earth individual. Mm. And, but Nikola Tesla, for whatever reason, and we don't know the specific reasons, his, was that his inventions were simply seen as um, available to all that would create literally boundless electricity, uh, boundless energetic potential that all mm. human beings around planet Earth could access freely and without any need to pay for any of it, which really in that sense would set humanity free from the concept that you have to pay. There is a cost of living here on planet earth mm. now we hark back to the time of the nordic hyperboreans who existed with a vast prevalence and their advanced occult technology across the arctic north polar region and therefore the arctic circle and obviously including northern russia and they on a, a much more massive population based scale you know had that mindset that electricity was something that was boundless it was always there it could be accessed by anybody by using just the rudimentary basics of occult technology for anti-gravity purposes, for electroculture, and therefore plant growth purposes. And it wasn't seen as something that you had to use a third-party debt usury 
system of you know coinage and notage or using you know now as we call it electronic currencies or e-currencies mm. you know to pay for the seeming privilege of having electricity you know transmitted uh into your residential property or a commercial or an industrial property for lighting and heating purposes none of that was needed so victor schauberger as with nikola tesla and they were inventors that exemplified the remnants of great tataria with their incredible scientific endeavors nikola tesla obviously looking through all the pictures and all the research i've done one thing i've noticed is nikola tesla got older it's almost he got sadder and more 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 distant almost from what he was creating it, it comes across in the paint pictures and it, it's well, quite sad yes. really mm. and it seems like that he had something that he really wanted to give to people and yet it was taken away and he, he knew that it wasn't possible I, i'm just interpreting this well he was very thing. aware of the corporate structures around him he was very aware that thomas edison was seen with a lot more favoritism thomas edison obviously with the seemingly designated role of being the individual that had invented the incandescent light bulb was then pushed forward by the corporations, the multinationals across the United States of America and Canada, and then around planet Earth with this idea, because the incandescent bulb could be screwed into a socket, a fitting that's connected to electrical wiring that can then be powered off from a substation that in turn is powered from you know, a coal-fired or gas-fired power station, and therefore, it could be metered, it could be chargeable at a certain tariff or rate to the general public in, in obviously in their residential properties or employees in a commercial building and buildings, therefore, and obviously in a, on an industrial scale. And none of this was something that made Nikola Tesla very happy. I don't think it would make the Nordic Tatarians of northern Russia very happy if their civilization had been around today mm. in the modern period you know, or the modern age, and they were living with boundless telluric electricity being drawn down into their stately homes, their mansions, and their healing temples into ground floor or basement electrical capacitors. And they're sitting there with boundless amounts of lighting and heating, and yet, uh, you know, a few hundred kilometres or miles to, you know, into Western Europe even, you've got people that would be paying for the use of electricity. It would be very bizarre because that kind of schism alone would create a, a questionable version of the 3D holographic reality we define as the material dimension for so many millions of humans. Because people would ask, well, how come, you know, theoretically, obviously on this level, that great Tataria is full of inhabitants that have got boundless telluric electricity for heating mm -hmm. and lighting. And here we are we have to pay for the usage of electricity. Why can't we all have the same um, free, boundless, telluric electricity distribution for residential, commercial, and industrial purposes all around planet Earth? Well, and if we just bring that up to date now and yeah. say, well, look, if we did have free energy in our world and the electricity was all free and we had this telluric energy and we weren't paying for it, we didn't have this cost of living, what would yeah. reality be like now? Hmm. I mean, I'm just throwing it out there in the sense of looking at it the other way, why we don't have that. Is there a journey, something that we have to understand before we can have the access to this knowledge or this a bit, you know, I, I, I'm always looking at it and I, for argument's sake. I, I would say that if you look at the inventions of Victor Schauberger and the inventions of Nikola Tesla, they wanted to create the embetterment of homo sapiens or human beings on planet earth by setting people free from the idea that you have to pay with coinage and notage for the access to and the usage of boundless electricity whether that's in the telluric form from the atmosphere or it's ground based it doesn't matter they were therefore positing the idea that we can have a new golden age or golden period on planet earth where what would happen is the majority of homo sapiens or human beings would be really focused on vocations for the embetterment of themselves scientifically and therefore culturally, but ultimately psychologically and emotionally to improve their own lifestyles, their own immediate families, their neighborhoods and the populaces of their own nations or countries. And I think 
that would then have led to a, a far greater new type of space age, one which pretty much all human beings and therefore humanity would be fully included within. So it would have gone from being a surface-based and therefore planet Earth-based sort of um, globalized civilization that had been, you know, f uh, really uh, developed out of the principles of Great Tataria in northern Russia. But that could have then been applicated into a new space age out there in the solar system and beyond, going out to locations such as Proxima Centauri and other very nearby uh, star systems in the Milky Way galaxy. And that would have, again, further led to even greater spiritual liberation for human beings. And what we have is this enclosed system, system with a capital S here on planet Earth, where human consciousness in many ways is looping. It's just going round and round and round. Mm -hmm. there's, the, there's these subtle states of constant arrested development. Instead of there being true progress by the application and usage of you know, commercially available and therefore available to all human beings, a cult technology where we should be using boundless telluric electricity for anti-gravity purposes, for electroculture, and therefore uh, crop growth purposes, which isn't taking place on any wide commercial level. So do you think this energy, the, tapping into this telluric energy, do you think it's still here? We can do this, we can access this now, we could, you know, why isn't, you know, I, I'm just throwing it out for the audience. Why isn't science questioning this? Why isn't science getting on board this and looking at this information, looking at this ancient history and researching this and working out wireless electricity? I think before, when when everything kind of happened back in the 1800s, I think uh, uh, it was almost like a landslide of events that happened. Yeah. And, and it wasn't expected to get to this point we are at now. I think no. what happened was there's been a confusion with a power trip that happened and these people just wanted so much power. Um, and as it's gone on, the, the journey of life and we've seen reality develop, we see all these things occurring, these these, 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 these awful situations around the world that are stemming from these, these systems that were done then. I think, you know, we've, we've talked many, many times in other Sacred Wisdom podcasts about the idea of the emergence of a new golden age or golden period possibly beginning, not, not being completed by, but beginning around 2034 to 2035 and then onward from that, that kind of period of time. And we will so, do yeah. a, an episode just on the golden age, everybody. So stay yeah. tuned for that. So if we go back to looking at the expanses across northern Russia, where the Nordic Tatarians had so prevalently developed their own advanced occult technology in terms of the construction of shining pyramids and what are also known as the crystal pyramids in locations such as the Yamalo Nanets Autonomous Ukrug of north central Russia, the Nanets Autonomous Ukrug of northwestern Russia, and the Tamirsky Dolgano Nanetsky district of north central Russia, uh, which extends along the coastline of the Arctic Ocean and reaches right up into the Arctic Circle. Now, if you were to take human beings uh, you know, on a guided tour of those areas and a lot of the glacial sheeting and the snow drifts you know, melted away and you can see these vast ruins of these shining pyramids and therefore the crystal pyramids of Hyperborea across this vast expanse of northern Russia, people wouldn't be able to cope with that because Western science has not taught that such a civilization was authentic it was just and has and still is seen as only a a story from greek mythology but we know that russian archaeologists have found the remains of many uh, of these shining pyramids and therefore crystal pyramids across different areas in northern russia they're not some kind of mythic story there actual was a civilization there that can be defined as hyperborea so the the, the so, so just say on that russia has fully accepted that there is this these pyramids some of the academics from um the russian federation have done extensive research site excavations have photographed these remnants none of which are taken seriously uh, by western science it, it is deliberately ignored it won't be taught in schools colleges and universities across western europe and therefore including the united kingdom of great britain 
or the Irish Republic, certainly not in the United States of America and Canada. So it, can I just uh, ask, uh, interject? so with the Western world, does the Western world keep things from Russia? Do they keep knowledge like that? There's definitely a bifurcation of um, scientific data or scientific knowledge between mm. the Western world and, for want of a better phrase, the Eastern world, which we can largely say most of the Russian Federation is part of, although technically you have what's called European Russia and Asian Russia, and they're kind of roughly divided by the, the actual Ural Mountains. Mm, so, interesting. That is very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Divided by them, right? Yeah. So You know but, what's at the Ural Mountains, or supposedly, yeah? Well, yeah, that's right, the po especially the polar Urals and the northern Urals and the connections to Hyperborea, and it's actually the polar Urals and the, the northern Urals that are known as the Raphaean mountains in Greek mythology. And it's, be, it's, it's, it's literally going in a more northerly direction into the far away north, up into the Arctic North Polar region, mm. that in Greek mythology, it was believed this beautiful landscape existed of Hyperborea with its balmy summers, the land of the midnight sun. But of course, and it is reported that people that have travelled into the North Polar regions, in the Arctic regions, they have actually found vegetation. There's trees and and plants, and 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 you well, know we're all, all told in the Western world that it's full of ice, snow. It's minus thirty exactly. degrees. There's no That's way right. to get there. But there's one yeah. one individual that we're both very familiar with, and that's Rear Admiral Richard Evelyn Bird, who obviously had an Arctic flight and actually actually visibly observed what appeared to be highly fertile regions with various types of trees or shrubs and certain flowering uh, plants and non-flowering plants and i think certain mammals that apparently uh, should be technically extinct according to western science of course yeah. so it yeah it's a lot of questions are left unanswered when it comes to what's really going on in the remotest geographic locations across planet earth not just in the arctic north polar region obviously in the antarctic south polar region as with even some of the remoter regions you know even across the russian taiga forests in siberia and the russian far east so there's so much that we don't know and a lot of the time human consciousness is deliberately being designed through the mainstream media to focus in on the minutiae of irrelevant subjects, keep people diverted, keep them spinning in circles, wasting their lives, wasting time and their years roll by on planet Earth and they're just caught up in the, the, the mechanisms of escapist thinking. Yeah, but they're not focused on the idea of free energy systems, the use of boundless telluric electricity, or the fact there was this immense civilization in, that had its own golden age or golden period called Hyperborea that eventually re-emerged as the civilization of Great Tataria in northern Russia. So none of this is discussed. It's not taken seriously, just as the subject of the Hollow Earth isn't taken seriously. The idea of the Rainbow City, which is purported to be a vast urban urban spaceport built down in the antarctic south polar region what, what do you think on that what what's your thoughts on on the rainbow city it being in the south pole it... i believe it's real um a number of uh credible witnesses have observed what appears to be this this vast construct called rainbow city it's called rainbow city because of the way it is it, it is built it's highly symmetrical um, the actual structure is right. a cuboid, it, you know, in shape, they're hexahedral or cuboid in shape, stacked right. in various Hexagon. patterns. Or Hex se so, uh, uh, wow, I didn't know that. Hexahedron I is the technical geometrical term for a, for a cube, a hexahedron. Right. What we do know is it's called Rainbow City because these cuboid or hexahedral um, sort of uh, structures that appear to be some kind of urban spaceport, because there's a lot of UFO activity taking place there as well, a shimmer because they're translucent so in, in in the direct sunlight of the antarctic south polar region and you can imagine you know with all the snow dunes the glacial sheeting the reflectivity of sunlight is very intense because of the translucent nature of these these very unusual prehistoric structures that are defined as rainbow city they actually create a prismatic effect so you right. get different colors shimmering across them and this has been seen by various commercial and military aircraft that have flown over the Rainbow City on many occasions in the Antarctic South Polar. And region. there is vegetation down there for sure. Because that, yeah. well, apparently, I mean, I don't know what, what I'm seeing isn't, isn't what they, you know, people were saying that it's the South Pole region. But from what I see from helicopter rides over the, uh, the Great Ice Wall, 
which is two and a half thousand miles long, which is very yeah. surreal. The photographs of the Great Ice Wall were just completely surreal. Yeah. So we know it was, it was highly fertile, temperate in climate down there because they found thousands of remains of palm trees yeah. buried under vast amounts of snow and ice. So we know. We also know in the Antarctic South Polar region, again, there was a, a vast network of huge shining pyramids or shall we say crystal pyramids, again, using quartz capstones, presumably, again, drawing down telluric electricity for you know various types of lighting and heating purposes for the use in construction, anti-gravity purposes and so on and so forth. So there seems to be a correlation there between what was going on in prehistory in the the antarctic south polar region and obviously what has been going on many aeons ago in the arctic north polar region with the civilization of hyperborea is there any technology that we have currently that is connected to these old technologies and do you think or is there any technology today that is using the ether to harness the electricity or using the earth's energy to actually bring up the energy what there's one there's only one answer to that yes there is but not on a commercial level it's not available to the general public so you're not going to see you know the the populations of france or belgium or holland or or denmark or germany or austria or switzerland or anywhere else in western europe getting access to that kind of uh you know free energy system based occult technology to draw down telluric electricity just as you won't see the populations of the united states of america or canada or any country in Latin America or across the Asian continent or anywhere else, because it would set any any country that has access to that that occult technology or any as, any little aspect, any any minuscule aspect of that. There are so many industrious individuals out there that would love to be able to study, uh, to dismantle, take apart such products. Yeah. And and then there'll be great, great diversification on a technical and specification level. This would lead to a huge commercialization in many different ways in a very economically diverse sense across planet Earth. And this would affect the corporations. And they don't want that, of course. Well, there is a there was a Tesla coil that was built in Western Russia back in the 70s. And it's been kind of very, very, very quiet, actually. It's very hard to find any information on it. I did That's manage right. to find a few pictures, which I'll put up on screen. But yeah, they are. It's quite incredible, actually, and I believe that this was actually would could actually send wireless electricity. That's right. So we know, obviously, we, it's not in functioning use. That is the only evidence I've seen on this planet that there is would, these devices. I, I, I would say it wasn't invented. I'd say it was reinvented. It was right. It was reformatted from older forms of occult technology. If you look at Great Tatari, we know that it initially existed from the 15th of August, uh, 342 BC. We know then after that, politically, it developed and became very sophisticated in terms of its uh, management of itself as a vast landmass in northern Russia from the 16th of February, 458 BC. So how soon after those dates, the Nordic Tatarians were developing their own telluric electricity based occult technology is open to speculation. But what we do know is that they had it for probably well over a thousand years. It was very stable in terms of their development. They had a very long period also of time, long duration, chronologically to develop their own occult technology, which obviously included the airships, anti-gravity platforms. And obviously we talked about vault lights and and many other aspects of their incredible civilization yeah i the more i've looked into the airships is that i'm re realizing that these were these were actually generators in themselves so actually giving the energy not not taking the energy up they were putting it down so you you had a duplication process but the removal of the free or bangless telluric, telluric electricity aspect of those um airships that were constructed with great um design specification diversity across Great Tataria and Northern Russia. And then obviously we've discussed how the demise of airships took place. They were no longer seen as commercially viable. There was seeming electrical fires that, that conveniently took place that were perhaps used on a speculation level, obviously I'm, I'm stating all this, 
to make it seem commercially unviable, uneconomic mm. and inefficient to use such forms of um, aerospatial based occult technology because it had originally been derived from Great Tataria and Northern Russia. And again, even the actual uh, visual appearance of these airships on some deep collective unconscious level may have actually riled up the memories of certain homo sapiens or human beings on planet earth that's interesting had a long-term yeah. memory of of how immensely incredible mm. great tataria was and the great scientific endeavors of the nordic tatarians who had maintained that excellent civilization so the airships were taking it from the ether but then obviously the the, the architecture the buildings which we talked about in the machines of tartaria these were acting like, you know, generators in themselves that were taking the energy up from the earth, right? That's right. So, so there's the same, kind of two different types of on... energy systems in a way, wasn't there? It were two types of um, absorption and distribution based uh, systems, uh, telluric yeah. electricity, sorry, telluric electricity based, you know, systems in place. And I think a similar process was being used in Hyperborea across the Arctic North Polar region, therefore the Arctic Circle. So you had these shining pyramids or these crystal pyramids, but they also had anti gravity based aircraft of some nature. And again, this is speculation, but it's likely they had onboard electrical capacitors. So we have discussed in airships of Tataria, one of the reasons they were used was to ritually travel out into the remotest geographic locations that were outside the large towns and cities of Great Tataria, where you had all the stately homes and you had the palaces and the healing temples that already had installed on the ground floor in the basement of those premises electrical capacitors to absorb and then redistribute the telluric electricity. So they would therefore tether these airships into remoter areas against, you know, Amazing. maybe an airship mast, and they would literally literally uh, transmit out vast amounts of this telluric electricity for heating and lighting purposes in, shall we say, the smaller towns or villages or settlements across Great Tataria. Incredible. And Steve, yeah, like there's so much on this and you can, everybody, you can always watch the other podcasts and go into more detail. We've got the machines, we've got the airships, check out the Sacred Wisdom podcast. So there's an aspect to this, which we is obviously very forgotten or erased, if you like. And that is about the giants uh, that were a part of Tartaria. And then there were certainly, you know, seven, eight feet high, much higher people, if you like, humanoids, the tall humanoids. Now, did they have some sacred knowledge? These giant, this giant race that knew about this, or were these the were they the builders of this technology? We must remember going back to the stories of Greek mythology, which discuss Hyperborea, that they discuss these Cyclopean giants or Hyperborean giants that are described as having pale white complexions. They're twelve to fourteen feet in height, and they were seen as architects. They were seen as engineers. They were seen as construction workers. So it is likely that many of these Cyclopean giants or, um, or Hyperborean giants survived the demise and destruction of Hyperborea in the Arctic North Polar region. As we've discussed previously, there are many stories from Turkic folklore uh, and so forth that discuss these these white giants seen walking around in the polar Urals and even across parts of the Kamchatka Peninsula in the Russian Far East and Siberia. And it's likely they would have descended into these cavernous openings and passageways and went down into the hollow earth, which would explain why when it comes to hollow earth folklore, there are connections to these white giants, the, 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 the giants folklore, for want of a better phrase, Obviously, there are vast amounts of stories from the, the American Indian tribes in the United States of America and the first Canadian Indians concerning the, the giants living in subterranean reaches. Mm. So if many of those giants had survived, they reemerged during the time of, of Great Tataria. They would have been integral because of their scientific knowledge, their scientific discernment of the various kinds of occult technology that had existed with such prevalence in Hyperborea. And that could have been reconfigured, reformatted, and then rolled out when manufacturing was taking place and installed and developed across different locations in Great Tataria and Northern Russia. So I think there is definitely a connection between um, the occult technology of Great Tataria 
and these these cyclopean giants or hyperborean giants as they were known you know many thousands of years ago uh, which then became known as the tatarian giants or the white giants of great tataria absolutely they were they were very much but I, I don't think they i don't think they were just picking up the rocks i believe they had some sort of sense uh, a way they could actually let make these rocks levitate or they could actually maneuver these rocks in a way completely different if you take the cy cyclopean walls for example and the way them them stone is cut the precision the, the how close they are to each other and perfect with no mortar whatsoever no, literally all. and they've been there for over a thousand years i'm not sure at the exact time they've been there for a very long time isn't they so they would I mean, they would what? have been yeah they would have been cut with some kind of condensed electrical beams or we can call them lasers perhaps even some kind of compressed electroacoustic transmissions that were used that was so powerful. I think it was done with sound. Solid rock. Do you think it was done with sound? Like like the Possibly. John Hutchison sort of style? Yes. There's yeah. there's definitely a, that's definitely feasible that some kind of advanced electroacoustic based occult technology was used that could literally cut through sheer rock. It could literally I find, I find it with I... absolute precision. I find just thinking then, of course, in in June, I don't know about the updated version, but the original, the David Lynch version, That's they right. use them weaponries, don't they? The sound weapons where they actually put and put that sound into the weapon and it fires that kind of laser. I mean, you know, just yes, that's so, out there. Uh, it's that's, interesting, um, though. I think it was Carl McLaughlin played um, Paul Atreides, who then became known as P Paul Muad'Dib. He was the leader of the Fremen, the mm. desert people on the planet Arrakis. That's right. And he trained, um, he trained all the, the, the Fremen were basically trained in the use of these, these um, uh, sound based weapons that could mm -hmm. cut through sheer rock. Yes, absolutely. That's very much part of the, the, the movie. Interesting. But yeah, that how that's, you know, connecting that to all the Tartarian building and architecture and all this. Um, one mind blowing aspect of the Tartarian culture that I I looked into, well, I know you have as well, is the star forts. Now, mm. there are over sixteen hundred of these left around the world, and we will be doing a whole podcast just on the star forts themselves. But these are absolutely incredible structures, all built in a way. I I don't believe uh, these were armory forts, as they're told. I can't see why you would build such a beautiful structure with per perfect geometry just to put a load of armory in and you know cannonballs and stuff like this, as as we're told they're used for. Mm. But the star forts were placed on particular, particularly where water was moving, rivers, seas, stuff like this. So the energy. Obviously, they were interacting with the the water and the movement of the earth. Um, but what were these other purposes? Were these star forts doing, Steve? Well, they were. They were, the star forts were actually absorbing and redirecting the piezoelectric currents from the flow of water. They were specifically built on geomagnetic ley lines, and, the, and many of them were built on intersections of those geomagnetic ley lines to create vortices. Now. We don't fully understand the exact hyperdimensional physics, but what we do know is there were connections to the astral plane, which is, you know, very interesting to note. So there was obviously a, a hyperdimensional aspect to the function of the star forts. So it is likely because of their connection to the astral plane and the fact they were constructed on geomagnetic ley lines and intersections, they were used also perhaps for healing purposes, stabilization of the magnetic field around planet Earth, and also to redistribute huge amounts of telluric electricity from the ether or the atmosphere. So uh, therefore, they were, again, another type of electrical generator. Uh, as with the you know the the actual electrical capacitors absorbing electricity from the steeples or spires of these healing temples and from the various metallic arrays that were erected or installed or constructed on the the roof lines of the various stately homes or palaces across Great Tataria and northern Russia. So, yeah, that they serve a purpose of electrical um, production 
and also the control of the piezoelectric currents from the water flow and how that interacts on a hyperdimensional level in terms of the geomagnetic ley lines and, in, and any of those intersections. And the astral plane is open to, shall we say, further speculation. But one thing that's important to note about these star forts or star fortresses is there are very, very, very few diagrams or schematics from the time that these were constructed. Now, yeah, obviously, when you right. look at the timelines, many of them were constructed a long time before we we, we understand that photography was invented. Mm. But what should be in place is in in various archives, whether that's in you know mainland Europe and therefore the United Kingdom of Great Britain and and Historic Northern Ireland. Records. Yeah, you know, or the Irish Republic or across North America. What we need is some kind of detailed level of diagrammatic illustrations or schematics from the architects or the engineers that were commissioned or and therefore tasked with the construction of these vast um geometric edifices in many different locations around planet Earth. So, for example, you've got Fort Butange in the Greningen province of the northeastern Netherlands, which is nearby right. the, the Wadden Sea. And there again, you can see the piezoelectric effect from the Wadden Sea in conjunction with the construction and development of Fort Butange in uh, the northeastern Netherlands and why that was important for that, that building to be constructed in that specific location. You have others, for example, such as the Castellet in Copenhagen in eastern Denmark. Now, this is interesting because we're told that it was officially constructed from the 18th of March, 1626, to the 30th of October, 1664, by King Christian Oldenburg, who was also known as King Christian IV of Denmark. But the key point is there's only one aerial diagram. Now, it's the, <laughs> that's all there is. And it's literally a, pe a pencil drawing on brown paper yeah. and nothing else. Nobody describes the, how the foundation. Oh, come on, in... Steve. It was just built. It's just an amazing architectural structure built in a matter of days. And... But it is interesting to note that the Castellet in Copenhagen, it, it, it is purported that there was the remnants of a previous type of star fort on the same location. And all wow. that took place was a modernization and a rebuild of the original star fort or star fortress that, that was in that part of Copenhagen in eastern Denmark. So the question is, well, why is there no diagrams of that remnant building? Why was there no archaeological inspections that took place? Why wasn't this recorded in any historical documents by, you know, by, for example, King Christian Oldenburg or King Christian IV in Denmark? Nothing's talked about we just have to be, accept the official historical timeline that that Pacific star fort was constructed by, you know, the royal family of Denmark. Which, and some again, people open to speculation. And some people might ask, why does that matter? What? What? Why does it matter? Who built it? Well, who cares now? Well, yeah. it does matter because whether you go with the, the idea of, of Tartaria being free energy and all this, just you have to look at these star forts and realize what they've become. And now, like what they are, if we take, for example, the one that stands out in my mind is down in Portsmouth on Gosport. They've actually turned an amazing architectural star fort into a bloody council estate. I mean, they've literally dumped a load of council buildings on top. Now, great. I'm, I'm pleased that everyone's housed and that's great. But these systems or these structures were absolutely incredible. They 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 were amazing. And please, and I will put a load up on the screen of visuals of the different shapes and stuff, but some of these are built half a mile, a mile out into the sea. Mm. And again, like the lighthouses, these would not have been an easy build. Even in today's no. age, it would still be quite a, a, a tremendous absolutely. achievement to do that. Yeah. So I think people really need to look at that. Where And again, as I said, if you don't believe in the free energy stuff, that's fine. Don't look at that. But even just looking at the architecture of how it was built and look how things are built today. It was a well, very advanced technology, very yeah. advanced building methods. And we should pay attention to that because we can build these buildings again. We can live this life again. But Steve, you know, um, Carrie, is there anything else with the star forts you'd like to chat? I chat? mean, there's many, many other star forts I could specifically mention, but one I think that's really fascinating is called the Gore Yukaku, which is in the city of ha of Hakoda Teshi, again in the Oshima subprefecture of Hokkaido Island in northern Japan. 
Now, wow. again, when it comes to diagrammatic illustrations, when it comes to architectural plans or schematics, there doesn't seem to be any information on the construction, the types of aggregate or building materials that we used, its foundations. We're just told to accept by Western science that it was built by, you know, either an emperor, a, a monarch, a general who was high up in the, you know, Japanese army or some other uh, you know, theoretical postulation that really and we're told these were used to protect the, the coastal, truth. you know, the coastal villages and stuff like this. They were used to protect for the boats coming in so they could fire out cannonballs. And they we're told that they're designed in a shape that these these geometric shapes so they stop the cannonball from hitting in a certain way. And I mean mm. this is this I, I personally think it's insane way of looking at architecture because I don't they, think and I don't think we are under that much attack to be honest. I think, yeah, and I think if you if you if you take the idea that even if we say these star forts or star fortresses in the modern age or modern period, in the last few hundred years, you know, were constructed by you know human beings in various parts of planet Earth that were nothing to do with Great Tatarian Northern Russia, we have to also remember that many remnants have been found across parts of the Russian Federation as with parts of Bulgaria and Romania and other countries in southeastern All over the place. Yeah, of really ancient or prehistoric-looking star forts or star fortresses. Well, you've got, you've got one of the main so, ones, Steve. You only have to look at where the Empire State Building is, and yeah. that would seem that it's built on a star fort. Yes. Well, that would make sense in terms of hyperdimensional physics, because if the star forts were constructed, as we now know, on geomagnetic ley lines, and obviously the Empire State Building, where it's located in the eastern United States, you know, very near to the North Atlantic Ocean, you, again, you can see that represents literally placing almost a monument over uh, the remnants of a star fort that once existed in that area of the, of the eastern United States replacing what was once there with something that uh, really isn't very functional. We will be doing more on the Star Forts. Absolutely fascinating subject, and there is so much to cover on this. I think we'll do a live as well coming up on all this and talk about the Star Forts, and we'll get Stephen on talking about it all. But there is uh, as some of these subjects. We don't cover Star Forts. But we've got some very interesting subjects in our book, Mysterious Realities, that you can purchase. And that is on Amazon in paperback and ebook in digital form. And um, Stephen, thank you again, my brother. It's been absolutely okay. amazing. It has indeed. Yes. <laughs> and if for now, it's a bye from me. And it's goodbye from me. Mm -hmm.